All right. Uh, hello, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and others in the Cal Maritime community. My name is Ryan Rodriguez, one of the career coordinators in career services, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Andre Zhang, mechanical engineer, class of 2022. Before we get started with today's program, I'd like to make a few quick public PSAs. First, uh, if you want to still get your vaccine, you can stop by the PAC today, and uh, even if you do not have an appointment, uh, just let the registration at the front desk know, and they can fit you in. They're going to be up there until 5 p.m. today, so if you want to get your vaccine, uh, head up to the PAC. Second, the National College Health Assessment Health Survey is now live. Complete the survey to provide critical student health information. Responses are anonymous and they help inform programming to improve health. The link can be found in your Cal Maritime email by completing. You can enter in a drawing for $200, $150, $100, and a $50 books, bookstore gift card or a $25 Uber Eats gift card. With that said, we are so excited to welcome you to our third event in the Conversations on Mental Health and Wellbeing series brought to you by the Mental Health Working Group here at Cal Maritime. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Ian Wallace, Andrea Schneider, Angelia Acosta, Vanita Dillon, and Professors Betts McNee and Tamara Burback for their significant efforts in organizing and planning today's events. Please note that this event is being recorded so that it may be available to the broader campus community. We appreciate the consent you provided earlier before these introductory remarks. During the video call today, please keep yourself muted, except when delivering applause, clarifying a question, or when otherwise prompted. With the event being recorded, be mindful of your screen as well, as other disclosures or personal presentation may be heard or seen during the event. With that, I'll kick it over to Andre for some remarks. Today's conversation entitled The Discussion with Mariners will bring to you rich and varied professional and personal experiences of three mariners as they have learned to manage their own physical, mental, and emotional health in the maritime world. Each panelist is enthusiastic to their stories and experiences abroad various vessels with the cadets and broader community of Cal Maritime and hope their decades of experience can provide valuable learning points for our cadets as they imagine their future within the industry. Today, we bring to you Captain Karen Annette Reyes, a member of MMP and captain with Patriot Contract Services, Cal Maritime class of 1998. Recently retired Chief Engineer Whit Matson and former member of MEBA, George Thanish, Cal Maritime class of 1994, and Dr. Stephen Lamb, crew physician on the MV African Mercy with Mercy Ships. All three panelists will help us better understand what challenges and decisions a mariner faces while both sailing and on land with regards to mental, physical, and emotional health, how to balance personal and professional relationships, and how to work within the parameters of the maritime industry to foster resiliency. Further, we will discuss how to handle transitions from ship to ship and sea to land, and how to create meaningful connections with fellow mariners and family to make these transitions easier. In these tumultuous times of an ongoing pandemic, political and racial unrest, as well as increasing mental health concerns among cadets and students at Cal Maritime and across the country, we recognize the importance of convening a conversation on today's topic. We hope that you come away from today's topic with greater knowledge of mental health trends in the maritime world, added sensitivity to your shipmates and their often unseen mental health struggles, and lastly, greater conviction to take action to your and others' maritime environments, more supportive of mariner mental health and well-being. Thank you, Andre. Uh, before introducing our panelists, let me just briefly go over the schedule for the next hour or so. So first, we'll introduce each panelist and give them a few minutes to dive in a little deeper on their career paths up to this point. Following these introductions, Andre and I have pre-selected several questions we will bring to the panelists for a moderated question and answer time. During this time, we ask you to submit to Andre any questions or comments via the chat function that he will sort through and use for our audience question and answer time following the moderated question and answer. To close out, we will finish with some concluding remarks. With that said, let's introduce our first panelist, Captain Karen Annette Reyes. Captain Reyes graduated from Cal Maritime in 1998 with a business degree. Prior to Cal Maritime, she had worked in the medical field as a radiology technologist. 
Captain Reyes joined MMP in 1999 and sailed on row row and container ships until 2014, working with Patriot Contract Services, Matson, United States Ship Management, and Maersk. She also served as a contractor aboard United States Navy ships during the second Gulf War. In 2014, Captain Reyes returned to the two Patriot Contract Services and has sailed master on board the USNS Pomeroy, the USNS Charlton, and is currently assigned as master on board the USNS Red Cloud. She was master on board the USNS Charleston or Charlton before the outbreak or during the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Please give a warm welcome to Captain Reyes. Up next, we have recently retired Chief Engineer George Stanish. Retired Chief Engineer George Stanish graduated from Cal Maritime in 1994 with his degree in Mar Marine Engineering Technology. He joined MEBA District 1 upon graduation, where he sailed on bulkers, tankers, car carriers, and container ships, working his way up the ladder from third assistant engineer to chief engineer. George holds a chief engineer license, steam, motor, gas, turbine, unlimited horsepower. Uh, he was then hired permanently with Matson Navigation, working as first chief and port engineer until recently retiring from MEBA and just received his first pension check on February 1st. Please give a warm welcome to retired Chief Engineer George Stanish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we have Dr. Stephen Lamb, who is a crew physician on the MV America or Africa Mercy. Dr. Lamb is an MD and Master of Public Health who joined the Mercy Ships organization two years ago. He recently finished up a tour in the in the Canary Islands. He lives in Washington State, where he has practiced family and emergency medicine for the past 34 years taking 17 years out to work as a flight surgeon and medical commander for the United States Air Force, retiring as Colonel in 2016. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lamb. All right, let's dive in then to some pre-planned questions that Andre and I will lead. Andre uh, will take us away with the first question. Okay, so I think a good place to begin would be with the effects you have witnessed on the vessels since the start of COVID. Uh, we will have many cadets partaking on cruises, either on the Golden Bear or commercial this summer. Uh, what changes in protocol have been put in place with COVID and specifically how have you handled not being able to go ashore while in port? And are you starting with me, Andre? Yes, it's open to discussion. Okay. Well, I was I was initially on board. It's been um, just about a year ago. I believe it was a it was a Sunday, um, I believe March twenty third, when we got the word um, that the gang would would be going up immediately upon receipt of the email. Uh, gangway up means uh, liberty is secured. Um, all reliefs were canceled. We had two crew members that had been on board six months for their contract and uh, they were scheduled to fly out the next day. So with little or, or no notice, uh, gangway went up for the COVID. Um, there was no end in sight. Uh, packages, provisions, stores, everything that we brought on board had to be disinfected immediately upon arrival to the vessel and disinfected as it was unpacked. Um, a short time later, uh, mask requirements went into effect. All crew were required to wear masks on board the vessel. They could be, you know, bandana, any makeshift mask or, or a mask from the hospital. Um, eventually they did send out um, masks to go with the uniforms. Um, there was a very strict sanitary and disinfected policy on board in all the common areas. Um, and for a while, all common areas and gyms were shut down. Uh, temperatures were taken twice daily. Uh, the best way we found to do that was as people were coming into the meal at breakfast and then again at dinner, we took their temperature to make sure that nobody was running a temperature that would indicate that they had come in contact with COVID. Also in place were very strict uh, pilotage precautions. The pilots were to be escorted to the bridge outside as much as possible. Once they went into the elevator and up, the elevator was closed until it was disinfected. 
um, on the bridge, everybody had to be in a mask. And once the pilot disembarked, um, the ship was not considered clean until all areas of the pilot had been had been disinfected in, in accordance with the CDC guidelines. So initially, that's what took place. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, that was challenging on everyone. Um, and it was much more difficult for the younger crew. Uh, some of some of us elder folks had been through this before during the Second Gulf War, and in and out of some foreign countries where certain uh, political uh, incidents were taking place. So we had been used to uh, restricted on board, if you will. What we did to try to alleviate some of the tension uh, that was going on around the ship were we held a, bar, a weekly barbecue. Um, on my particular ship, we had um, a space to do that. And so during our weekly barbecue, we allowed the crew to uh, have games or tournaments. And some of the crew members, um, the deck department made cornhole games. Um, they had one that was our ship, and then they had one that was the images of the COVID, you know, little red COVID images. And uh, then the engineers made a set of cornhole games. And so there were competitions on board once a week. Um, we also had basketball tournament, uh, hoop tournaments, who could shoot the most hoops. We had movie nights uh, that we set up, um, stuff like heating line competitions. You know, we had to, to really get inventive, if you will. Um, I had an excellent chief officer that took on a lot of this uh, for us and came up with a lot of ideas uh, to keep the crew um, entertained, if you will. Um, we offered as much overtime as we could with the budget, and it was a good time for people to work versus going ashore. So a lot of them did take advantage of that. Uh, it was not required of them if they needed to take some time off and go in their room and read a book, they were allowed to do that. Um, we also requested, and we were granted by Patriot Contract Services, to spend additional funding on board games. And we bought a lot of board games, chess games, uh, checkers, cards, dice. Um, we put a list out there so that the crew members could tell us what games they would like to see on board. And those were ordered via Amazon and delivered to the vessel, of course, disinfected, and then put out for the crew to enjoy. Um, we had a good gym, and that's something that is very important, I believe, on all ships today, is to have a good workout facility and a good gym cardio, as well as any uh, weights and, and things that the crew can use, because as you know, um, taking care of the body helps take care of the mind. So keeping busy was a big thing, keeping the crew busy. I had a very young crew during this uh, trip, so it was a, a little more challenging, if you will. And uh, most all of them responded extremely well to the, to the, um, the challenges that were before them. Um, extra work, I think keeping busy during these times is very important. Um, one thing I was going to say to the cadets going on cruise, if you have hobbies that you can take with you on cruise, um, guitar, if you play guitar, or if you wanna learn guitar, take a guitar on board, um, learn a language. Um, take your Kindle and, and have a set of books you want to read, and then try to get into the gym. Um, if you could get out and do your celestial. Um, when I was third mate, I was always looking at the second mate job. Uh, second mate, I was looking at the chief mate job. So I was working a lot of extra if you just stay busy. And if you have any questions, you know, go in and talk to uh, your instructors. Um, for the trip, I think that it will still be a great trip. Uh, without going ashore, but it's going to be what you make it. So keep that in mind. Today, we're still looking at a lot of things with COVID. We still have what we now call a, a ROM, which is a restriction of movement. Before you go into a vessel for two weeks, you have to sit in a hotel room, isolated by yourself. Your Kindle, your guitar will come in handy. Um, some, some companies are doing that in conjunction with a valid COVID, uh, negative COVID test. Some of them have two COVID tests before you can join the vessel. Mask mandates are pretty much still in effect on board the vessels, and there are st still strict pilot requirements for anybody that comes on board, but especially the pilot who's going to be going up to the bridge and around your bridge team.
George, Dr. Lamb got any anything? To uh, well, my experience was a little bit different. My last seagoing job uh, was uh, ended on July 31st, and Masson's policy at the time was that uh, once you know the stewards department wore masks, but everybody else would get their temperature taken for a few days after joining the ship, then you were considered good to go. So the bulk of the crew was not wearing masks. Um, but I felt it was a bummer for the guys that lived in Hawaii because I, the run I was on was just from Hawaii to the West Coast to, to Oakland. And the guys that they, Hawaii were not allowing anybody off the ship to go ashore. So all the cats that lived over there, they were pretty much bumming. They'd been on the ship for several months and couldn't go see their families. You know, they talked to them when they were home, but they, they couldn't get off the ship. But at least we were able to get ashore in Oakland. And um, the only other thing that they were doing at the time was separating all when all the vendors would come off for repairs in port. They would uh, isolate the vendors from the house, so they weren't allowing them in the house. And um, yeah, that was pretty much my experience. Yes, uh, I was in uh, on the Africa Mercy. We were uh, in port in Senegal when this all came down, and we were seeing a lot of patients. We had a hos we have a hospital ship, about eighty beds uh, for patients. And when it happened, we realized that we were probably a bigger threat to the country because we rotate a lot of crew uh, coming from 40 different countries all over the world uh, into that country, because a lot of our crew is short term um, to handle different types of surgeries that we do. And so we had to, early on had to shut off the uh, incoming crew to avoid the appearance that we were bringing COVID into the country. And uh, when we did that, that meant we couldn't continue the surgical operations as well. So we took us about a month to get everybody uh, healed up and and uh, discharged and arranged for follow-up care on the, on the uh, host country. And then we sailed back to Tenerife on the Canary Islands where we normally do shipyard every year for six to eight weeks. And then we go to an African country for 10 months and then back to shipyard for about two months is our normal cycle. But when we came back out of cycle, of course, like everyone else, we didn't know what to expect, but we were basically a bubble because we were not allowed on shore by the country, but we also felt that it wasn't safe for us to go on shore uh, to get infected. Uh, we'd already seen the Diamond Princess and others. Uh, and well, we didn't want to represent, recreate that example. Um, and I have heard since that the maritime community in general has said that's not the way to handle it. We know that now and we're not gonna do it, but we had a bubble with no COVID on board and we kept that bubble, but for six months, they didn't have any uh, shore leave at all. I came just as that was starting to open up. Things were, uh, and for several reasons, we had a bunch of contractors. We're going to have to do a lot of work on the ship. And then we, um, we also uh, had to, there were a lot of people that had been there a long time and needed to get home. And the airports were starting to allow selected people to leave. So we um, decided it was time to go into all masks. While we were in a bubble, we didn't wear masks. But when we decided the bubble's going to have to go, to bring contractors on to rotate crew out and in 140 crew on the ship and um, so we instituted masks for everyone a uh, gangway checks uh, with temperatures and the covid questions and everyone that came on to sh the ship as a crew was in quarantine for 14 days uh, we had a policy where we would allow them out in seven days if they were really vital in terms of their function on the ship we needed them out sooner if we got a negative COVID test and then the process, do, but the, even then they were in a restricted status. They had to eat their food in their cabin because in the dining room, we all take off our masks and it's the most vulnerable spot on the ship because we're sitting not a full six feet distance, but not as far as we would like. And um, so we, uh, and after 14 days of either quarantine or restricted status, then they were back in the normal crew, but we still wear masks all the time because of the contractors coming and going. Um, but in the process, those seven day checks were quarantined for seven and then you test out. If you have a negative test, you get out. We found four, four people that were positive for COVID, um, kind of one at a time in a tag team fashion, but it, uh, it enhanced, it, uh, increased our awareness and helped the crew understand the threat was real. It's not imaginary. And, um, but because these all arrived in quarantine status, it never took hold on the ship. There was no transmission on board, but a lot of changes happened. Um, at that same time, we changed from having, being able to serve ourselves in the dining room line 
We had servers to minimize the risk of passing uh, disease from the utensils to one another. Uh, we had uh, all of our meetings became more video wherever possible, video meetings um, with smaller group sizes, uh, spacing out um, the six feet apart when we did have meetings. We have a lot of, because it's a, a faith-based organization, we have a lot of uh, meetings every week that involve singing, but we could no longer sing on board. We could play instruments, but only if they didn't involve wind. If you use a trumpet or a clarinet or uh, any kind of a wind instrument, um, you project much farther than you would by talking and singing projects much farther than talking. So you could play those things out on the, uh, on the deck. Uh, you could sing on the deck it with, still with masks, assuming the wind would help us out. But these were the kind of compromises that we used. We too played a lot of games like Captain described. Um, that was very helpful, especially for the younger ones. Um, a lot of group games. Um, I think another thing that was very helpful is we still had good internet access and we had uh, video conferencing with our family and our friends. Um, I, I spoke to my wife every night, um, uh, frequently for two hours or more. We just chat while we were doing whatever else we were doing in our space. Um, and I think that's probably a good place to stop just to say that, you know, we did a lot of similar things. I would, one more thing I would add is that we had um, people that had the worst problems because we always had a crew physician on the ship uh, and chaplains, we would work with them. And if it was beyond our capability to help them enough, we'd get them online with a video counselor, uh, counselor selected by the organization to help us out that knew, usually these counselors had been on that ship before, so they had history. And most of the time that was dramatically helpful and people felt much better and could res resume work, maybe some modifications to help them out. But the ones that were really bad, there was a rare one that was so bad that just nothing we could say or do would help. And we would just arrange more urgent transport, find them a way home, get exceptions to waiver policies from immigration and so forth. And we got them home as soon as we could. But the counseling was tremendously helpful. Um, Dr. Lamb, uh, our uh, social worker on campus, Andrea Schneider, is asking if you could provide um, potentially a name for the counselor that was that was kind of helping you guys out or the counselor service. Yes, I can, the Mercy Ships folks in our headquarters, uh, we have some uh, counselors there, some licensed clinical uh, uh, counselors that we use and they have referrals that they use and I can uh, get you those names and I'll awesome. send them to you. Okay, cool, yeah, shoot me an email and, and we can get that out to people. Um, so kind of moving away now from COVID, uh, being at sea, we know, can cause some alienation, especially resulting in missing personal milestones of others as well as your own. So how have you guys handled being away from friends and family for long periods of time? Uh, how did you build connection with home and build connection with your shipmates? And then how do you find balance uh, between work life and personal life? And uh, George, we'll kick that uh, question off to you first. Okie dokie. Well, let's start with the first phase of the question. So how have I handled being away from friends and family for long periods of time? Um, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It can be very, very difficult uh, and challenging. When I started shipping out, all we had was email, which was transmitted three times daily. So it wasn't even real time. So that was your primary means of communication. You know, as of late, with all the ships having Wi-Fi and WhatsApp, it's become much more tolerable and, and easy to to keep connected with your friends and family. You know, you can just FaceTime them via WhatsApp um, and, and, and chat it away. Um, so, so, you know, like I said, it can be very mentally taxing being gone. It depends. It would really depend for me anyway, on, on the nature of the run as to what sort of condition I would come back after the, the tour. For instance, you know, early on in my shipping career, you know, I've made several long, long runs, you know, the one that's, that's memorable was I went to Africa one time and it took us, the particular ship I was on, it took us 42 days to get there at sea. And then we turned around and came back and it took us 42 days to get back. And we were all completely nuts when we got off of that thing. I mean, we didn't, you, you didn't even, and we didn't even realize it. We, we, you know, to try to acclimate to society in such a short period of time after a run like that is, is incredibly difficult. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, towards the latter part of my career, I was on the on the Hawaii run. They call it the pineapple run, and that's four and a half days to Hawaii, and then four and a half days back. 
And that and that's a piece of cake, particularly when you, you couple that with a real quality crew, it can be a very, very enjoyable experience. Um, as far as coping mechanisms, you know, uh, for a while, my personal story is uh, I turned to substances were my primary uh, primary coping mechanism, and it's really easy to do, you know, particularly when you get off the ship with uh, with months on end, you know, a bunch, a bunch of money in your pocket and, and, and no Mondays for several months. It's, it's really easy to turn down that road. So um, that's, that's something to take note of. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've, I've surpassed that one. And, and, and then, you know, I do, I would do a lot of meditation on the ship and, and go out, and, you know, just at the end of a tough day, I would just go out and stare at the ocean and, and look at the stars and just reflect and think about what's going on. And that, that, and also get to, you know, if you can get to know your shipmates, actually one of the funnest things that we would do on board the ship is play Call of Duty. We, uh, the rooms were all hardwired. So we would just shoot the heck out of each other after, after work every day and then talk mad smack the next day. And it's a great way to be social and antisocial at the same time, because maybe, maybe at the end of the day, you've, you've been seeing the same guy, the guys, you know, working, eat, eating every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you don't maybe just don't necessarily want to see the guys, but you're able to sit from the privacy of your own room and play Call of Duty, which was was quite a quite a good time actually. So um, if I've adequately answered this question, how have I uh, found a balance between work life and personal life? Um, you know, you when you work, you work, and when you're home, you do your home thing. I mean, that's that's kind of it. I have a lot of hobbies, and so when I get off the ship, I I, I would I would partake in all my hobbies. And then when it was time, when the bank account was dry, then I'd go back to work. That's kind of the way it worked for a lot of years. But uh, anyway, that's that's all I got on that. Thank you. I guess um, one thing that was very helpful for me when it comes to long separations, and um, I had more experience probably with uh, military deployments, which were similar in that way. Um, but even on the ship, it really helped to get a routine established. When I arrived at on the ship um, or, and a lot of times when you arrive, things are changing enough. You're learning uh, the ropes and you don't even know how to establish a routine yet. But as soon as you get to a point where you've got things kind of sorted out, I would establish, you know, what things I wanted to do on a daily basis, what things maybe on a weekly basis or two or three times a week, just write it out. So I had it organized in my mind and I seldom looked at the list after I wrote it. But when I couldn't remember I, or I'd get discouraged or Struggle, struggling, I would look at that. Say, oh yeah, I haven't been doing this. But things to include are the things you hear so many times because they really are effective. And that was to get enough sleep instead of sitting up too late at night watching, you know, scan, surfing the web or watching movies or whatever. We just cut it and say, you know, I'm gonna. I, I realize when I get tired, I don't feel good, and so I'm just gonna go to sleep now. Finish this one tomorrow, and uh, then you didn't run out of movies quite so fast because you're watching them a little each day. Um, but it also meant that. Um, I was getting enough sleep, get enough, uh, making sure I got a lot of fluids, make sure I got some exercise on a routine basis. Uh, I did, you miss that for too long and the endorphins you get from exercise aren't helping you. Uh, you need to get the endorphins back. Exercise really does help. Um, I, finding things that you really like to do and scheduling those in so you don't forget those. Sometimes you get busy and you do work and you may forget to do the things that are fun. Um, I know it's not a problem for everybody, but I think it, uh, for those that get tied up in work, uh, sometimes you wake up and realize you haven't been doing the fun stuff for a long time. And so you can put those in your plan too. But making a plan was really helpful for me. Um, as far as uh, when transitioning, when you come and go from home to ship, uh, each time you go to that environment you've been away from, it has morphed while you were gone. They're not doing the same things they were when you left. And it's very easy to step in and be critical and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is how we do this when you haven't really been there for a while. That's not how they're doing it now. Now the change may be for good reason, it may not, but I found it really helps to avoid conflict and hurt feelings and uh, smooth the transition. If I start out with um, just assuming there's a good reason for everything and have a wide swath of grace. And so, um, when you see things being done differently, you're mostly observing and watching and maybe you can figure it out yourself why. And otherwise you can ask in a really kind way, oh, we used to do it like this. What, why are we doing it different now? Um, I found historically when my wife was disciplining the kids different, sometimes she just got tired and just started slacking up and didn't realize that the things had gotten out of hand. And so then I could help bring them back where they were. But other things had a very good reason for change. And then I can support that because now I understood it too. 
but just being careful when you get back not to be too critical when you first arrive on the ship or in the home. Um, I think those were some helpful things that we did. And I agree with, with both uh, uh, George and um, my, I agree with both George and Stephen. Um, for me, um, the alienation, it is challenging. And as Stephen said, when you come home, a lot of things are different. I mean, the favorite breakfast used to be this, now it's this. Um, there's a lot of things that are missed. And some of the things that you can do before you leave, if you know you're gonna miss a, a birthday, you can set up for the balloons to be delivered to the school before you leave, make sure that everything's taken care of pre-planning, um, knowing that you're gonna miss those events. Uh, if it's your own birthday you miss, so my joke is always, I didn't have to get a year older this year. But um, so there's a lot of things that you can do to try to alleviate some of, of the feelings of alienation. Um, staying busy on the ship is one of them for me. Um, as I said before, you know, I, I, ships, there's non-ending work. So you can always find yourself uh, working. Um, at home, when you come home, I think that first week is a, a large adjustment. So things are changed, things are new. You, you've been, you know, kind of isolated on the ship. You go in the grocery store, there's like all these colors and uh, choices of what you can purchase. And so the first week is a little bit rough. You find yourself sleeping more. Maybe you just travel for like 48 hours in coach or something and you're exhausted. So you're gonna sleep more. Um, and then just building back up into the relationship with the family. Um, on board the ship, I think it's different. To keep, it's a little bit different. You wanna keep your balance by trying to find uh, shipmates that have like interests you can talk to. Um, hang out with, uh, you know, play cards, play guitar, whatever you're going to do, find people of like minds that you enjoy spending time with. And um, nowadays, it's a lot easier. As George said in the beginning, we were lucky if we got an email off the day. And after time went on, sometimes you had messenger, you could write, you could be text, you know, um, nowadays, there's internet on a lot of ships, so you can even sometimes have enough bandwidth to FaceTime your family, uh, WhatsApp, um, email, a lot of times even phone call. We used to have the satellite phones that were very expensive. Nowadays, uh, you may get close to land, you can even use your cell phone. So there are a lot of ways to keep uh, in touch with your family while you're gone. Thank you. All right, so before I go into the next question, as a reminder, please, uh, if you have any other questions you would like to ask the, uh, our panelists, uh, please privately message me in the chat. Uh, so the next question would be, I, a lot of the panelists already been mentioning a little bit about this, but uh, what are ways you've seen the industry and your employers or employ, employ, yeah, employers uh, make a conscious effort to support the overall well-being and mental health of their mariners. So we could begin with uh, Dr. Lam. Sure. Um, just uh, before I go into that, I wanted to add, I really appreciate what the captain said about the missed holidays and, and special uh, family events and all. The, um, and certainly preparing in advance is, is a great way to, to kind of mitigate the impact of that. Uh, another way we found that helped a lot too was we kind of de-emphasized the exact date. Um, holidays and birthdays, we were always able to celebrate when we wanted to. So we celebrated them some other time. As a family, we decided when we were gonna celebrate a holiday or birthday. And we changed the birthdays. We changed them into birth weeks, occasionally birth month. But birth week means all week long, you get to pick your whatever, you get to pick the food we're gonna eat for dinner, the desserts, the movies we're gonna watch. You're king for, or princess or queen for a week. And they actually liked that better than they did the old fashioned birthdays and they didn't want to do birthdays anymore. So um, uh, anyway, I thought that was a very helpful thing. If, as long as you kept making it up, they forgive you for missing the days. But when you stop making it up, they stop forgiving you. So I just wanted to pass that. I really appreciate the captain bringing that up and I wanted to add that too. Now, as far as the organization, 
um, I would lump it into two categories. There's screening for crew, and then there's uh, addressing the problems when they arise, um, or yeah, more or less screening. Uh, I think most organizations, it probably varies a lot, but our organization does a lot of screening for health problems, mental health problems, uh, inc incompatibility potentials. And if we find significant red flags, we may recommend that they work somewhere else. Sometimes we'll work them in our, our headquarters. We like them for their skill sets. They work in the headquarters on shore rather than on the ship. Um, or we may just say, you know, we just don't think it's a good fit and they'll have to work with a different organization. Um, but I think the screening does reduce the likelihood that somebody's going to be on the ship and decompensate and just find out later that they weren't really cut out for whatever it is we're doing or whatever the stressors are going to be. So screening was very helpful, I think. Um, and we, the ones with the red flags, we'd have additional screening. Say we'd have a specialist give us a consult or one of our counselors talk to somebody about their beliefs and all that to help us define, you know, so sort of an extra secondary screening if we saw the red flags potentially. Um, once you hired them, once they're all part of our organization, uh, then we do have um, briefings and handouts and all sorts of things to try, and, um, to try to prepare each one for the anticipated stressors. I think most organizations do some of that. Uh, and as I mentioned before, when we really do get into um, a problem where somebody's struggling, uh, we use the resources on board. Uh, once in a while, we'll have an extra uh, a person that's hired doing one thing. It turns out that they have skills in counseling or some other uh, skill that we could use. We utilize that first. And if that's enough, we're good. If it's not, we get online, like I said, with the counselor on a video chat. And if we need to, we can send them home. But the organization has kind of arranged all of that um, in preparation for these events because they've been going on long enough. Mercy Ships have been a little over 40 years now, and they have been trying to learn uh, as they go what works, what doesn't, and what do we do when it doesn't work? And so I think this is actually a pretty good uh, system we have now. It doesn't eliminate problems, but it does help you get to the answers a little quicker, yeah? That's about all I have. George or Captain Reyes, any, any other things to offer? I guess I'll go first here. Um, the, the industry has changed over the years and uh, with my company, if we have, um, as Stephen was saying, if you have somebody that even though they've been screened, they've been through um, all the mental health checks, um, they're sent out to the vessel and then they uh, demonstrate uh, something that would make you think that, give you the impression that they're, they're not quite uh, ready for the situation that they've gotten themselves into. Um, usually, um, we'll, we're very open about that. My door's open. They can come in to me and talk about what's going on. Um, if it's severe enough, I do reach out to the company. The company is a great resource. They can um, uh, provide you with a lot of different ideas and professionals. Um, and so that's always an option. Uh, I've seen the industries over the years, they're advancing leaps and bounds as far as taking care of these issues um, and taking care of the people. I know that uh, uh, it just, for instance, when we were stuck on the vessel with COVID and we were bringing the ship back across, we were uh, the Patriot, Patriot Contract Services uh, in conjunction with the president, uh, Mass Bardot, and then our crewing uh, coordinator, Captain Reisner, they were instrumental in getting us diverted into port where we got half the crew relieved. So that was a lot of work and effort on their part. Um, so I see the companies doing a lot. They're assisting us with getting our gym set up. They're assisting us with getting uh, extra stuff on board for the crew to be entertained. And I've just seen over the years, a lot more involvement from the companies and from the industry. And even the United States Coast Guard today is sending out uh, emails asking for, you know, questionnaires on mental illness, input, um, stuff of that nature. So I believe the whole industry is getting more involved in this topic. Well, uh, my experience, I really haven't seen a lot in way of the employer making a conscious effort 
to support the overall well-being. Um, you know, I, there, there's certain individuals that worked at the company that I felt really cared about the well-being of those on the ships. But, um, you know, it is it is a corporation and it is about the bottom dollar, um, although they may put it in their safety and quality management manual that, um, you know, they'll sugarcoat it a lot. But what the bottom line is, is, is the almighty dollar. Um, what I what I have seen in way of the industry supporting and pretty much this is the, the, the best thing I've seen as of yet is what you guys are doing here. It's, I think it's a really good thing. Um, but I think the best way to support it, at least what I've done in the past, is just to set the tone on the ship and just to be there for everybody and try to make a tight knit uh, group on, on the ship because you're out there. You're out there. I mean, the company's here and you're here and, you know, you'll, you'll talk back and forth via email, but ultimately it's you out on the ship needing to take care of your own beefs, you know. So um, that, that that's kind of what I've seen in the past. It's just, uh, you know, setting the tone and taking the time to talk with everybody and get closer with everybody and make kind of a harmonious environment in the workplace that seems to work the best from my experience so yeah gotcha gotcha it's not, definitely something we can uh, keep working on here at Cal Maritime and um, creating an environment same way just like that for sure uh so next question uh contracts within the maritime industry are varying and each of you have kind of touched on your different contracts and so on and so forth so how did you guys go about determining uh what type of contracts and hitches you would seek when starting in the industry and then how did you find that changing over time, um, you know, as you got older, different experiences and stuff and, and wanted to kind of transition? Uh, so, Captain Reyes, we'll kick it to you first for that question. Okay, well, I count myself very fortunate. Uh, Captain Lynn Corwatch took me in and uh, assisted me in, in joining a Master's Mates and Pilots January 3rd of 1999. And um, from that point forward, I was with MMP. And in the beginning, I took the first job that came up that I was eligible for. So I was not picky. A job came up, I took it. Um, I didn't wait around for a better job. I took the one that was there for me to take. As time progressed um, and you gain seniority with the union, of course, you'll have more choices. Uh, you can make your choice depending on the length of the tour the length of the voyage, uh, where the ship goes, if there's a certain part of the world that you really want to see and this ship goes on that run and sit back and wait for that, or even, you know, the length of the tour, basically. So um, as you get older, you can be pickier and, uh, you know, go with those companies that are going to promote you if you want to be promoted. Um, some companies, it's easier. Uh, to get promoted, and more, some are more difficult. So depending on if you want to get promoted, you might want to go over with those companies. Um, if they have more jobs, more ships, but it can be a variety of things from the run to the length of time on board. And then also the pay as you start to get up there. And that's it. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to start with uh, first thanking George for bringing up the idea that uh, yeah, the company is there and the ship is here. And while they may want to help or, or whether they do or don't, the ship is really on its own. And um, that reminded me in terms of communicating and figuring out how to deal with the issues ourselves um, with what we had. Uh, one of the things we did was uh, we collected questions from the crew and uh, leadership would then questions about the changes, the restrictions, the things they didn't like, things they would like, anything. It's all, there are no fouls here. And then we would take those questions and we lined them all up, grouped them into categories, communicated with headquarters and any other resources we could to get answers to all their questions. And then we had a town hall where we went over those answers. And some weeks we had three town halls because things were changing so fast. Uh, but then we would post the answers to the questions online so everybody could look them up. They're, because they're going to forget. And um, it really helped a lot to sort of de-escalate a lot of tension because they were heard and the questions they wanted to know the answers to were, were provided in a verbal and, and in a written form that they could access at will. Um, now back to the contract issue. Um, I, I like the captain, I think I, it was more, the contract was 
originally started with the organization that I wanted to join. We really loved the mission, how they, the surgeries they did, the before and after pictures of the African people that couldn't afford or have any access to the surgeries they needed. And so we were able to um, uh, help them in a way that they couldn't get any other way. And we really attracted to the mission and the organization itself had beliefs and values that were consistent with our own. And it was a medical mission. My wife's a nurse and I'm a doctor. So we were drawn to, this is something we can do. We would really enjoy doing. So it would have had to be a pretty bad contract to keep us away. Um, but so it's the secondary concerns, our length of contract, like Captain said, and they were at a two year commitment, which um, during COVID, all commitments got shifted around. It didn't turn out to be what we thought any of us thought they would be, but they had shorter term commitments for different positions. But we thought at that point, we were so convinced we took the longer one and have not regretted that. I'm still, uh, even if I'm, when I'm home, I'm online adjusting policies uh, for their next trip back to Senegal and so forth. So we're still working with the company, even when we're not on the ship and helping the ship with consultation and so forth. So. Um, but I, yeah, I think it, it certainly ha helps to have it a mission that your heart is into. Uh, if it's something that you don't like the looks of, you don't, it doesn't mean it won't turn out better than you thought, but I think it's kind of a, a downside going in. If it's not a mission that you could really feel like it's something you want to support and be a part of, then that's a strike against it. And it'll be a little less hard, uh, less easy to tolerate it when you're on. But if you go in and you at least like the mission as a whole, but then when you get on, if things aren't what you thought, at least you're still, there's some good points that you came in with, the length of your, uh, the length of your tour, uh, the locations, uh, the type of work you're doing um, can help compensate if those were all in alignment with whatever else you might not have liked once you got there. And I, th I thank you for the chance to share with you again. Well, when I and started- if I may, want to add. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, start with, with something that you had said, uh, George, uh, as well as Stephen. Uh, one thing is keeping the crew informed. I know when COVID first started, uh, we were having meetings, daily meetings, so that I could pass the information. Because what you didn't want was your crew to be out there wondering what's going on, why are we restricted, what's the latest, and why is this being implemented, why do we have to take... So we were having meetings pretty much daily. Um, and sometimes twice daily, where we would have an all hands meeting in the beginning. And as, if there was nothing that day that was new or changed, we could go a couple of days, but we were having all hands meetings with the crew so we could discuss uh, what was coming out to me regarding COVID, the latest and, and greatest, uh, what they had determined and the way that it was spread. So we held a, actually a lot of crew meetings, trying to keep everybody on board, everybody informed so that nobody was out there just wondering um, and, and also trying to build that cohesiveness between us. Okay, this is what's going on. And by the way, we're gonna have a barbecue, there's a cornhole tournament, you know, let's pull ourselves together. So, um, and try to keep everybody, you know, on board with the, what was going on. Thank you, I'll turn it over to you. Well, hello again. Uh, just so, so it, uh, with respect to the, what contracts I would take, uh, in the beginning, I pretty much took uh, any old scow they threw at me. Um, like these guys were saying, you really don't, you, there's no seniority. Uh, when you first join the union, you kind of got to just take whatever you can get. Um, you know, my my goal was the whole time was to work for Matson. That's always the company I wanted to work for. So I just, I worked my way up the ladder, gained seniority and finally got, uh, ended up getting a permanent job. Typically the, the shipping companies will hire the, the captain, the mate, the chief and the first, uh, they'll hire, Hire them permanently. Well, you know, you still go. You're still a member of the union. You still go by the union contract, but to create some continuity on board the ship for, for to to offset the the rest of the crew, the rest of the assistant engineers and mates are all rotary, so they're constantly it's a revolving door of of training new people, and so to create some continuity of, of knowing the ship, they hire the the top four uh, permanently. So I ended up kind of just working my way up, taking anything I could get until I was hired with Matson and then, um, you know, got the, got the ship that I wanted and the run that I wanted, which was the, the pineapple run back and forth to Hawaii. That's the gravy run where, uh, you know, you're just cruising bra. So, uh, and, uh, it was, it was, you know, it, it started out, it was a little rough in the beginning, 
because you would be away for long, long trips um, and you never knew, you know, it, it's kind of a crapshoot with respect to who you're going to get on board. And it really, it, it's what they say, one rotten apple, right? I mean, and, it, and it's actually true. If there's somebody that, that maybe you're not the biggest fan of, you not only have to work with that person, but you have to see them at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And after some time, it does get a little challenging. But, um, but it also, it, it also, you know, I just, I don't, I think this is the last question on the thing. I just wanted to, to kind of let y'all know that I wouldn't change a thing. If I had to do it over again, I would go to see it. It's been an incredibly rewarding career. And I mean, I'm 50 years old and I just retired. I mean, to, to, I can, I can get a whole nother career going if I so choose. And, at, you know, it can be incredibly fun too. One of my last trips uh, was, was with Tamara's husband, Scott. And it was probably the funnest time I've ever had on board a ship. <laughs> What's up, Tamara? Yeah, it was the bomb. I mean, we had so much fun. We were just constantly laughing and joking. And it's possible to have a ton of fun out there. So it's just, you know, it's kind of up to you the, what you make of it. So uh, anyway, that's all I got. Thanks. Well, yeah, and as, as George said, that is, uh, that is all the questions that, um, that we have that have been submitted. So um, just quickly, last for the, for the panelists, if you have any closing remarks or anything um, last that you would like to, to leave with the cadets in the community at large, um, now's your chance, pop in and um, leave any closing remarks. Um, well, I'm going to second George. It's, um, it's an incredible career. I wouldn't change a thing. I have enjoyed it. I traveled the world. I, I circumnavigated the globe in 140 days back when we were making radar maps. Um, it's been incredible. Um, it's provided for my family and I, I wouldn't change a thing. If you're looking to go out to sea, I think you have uh, just a world of opportunity to look forward to and I wish you all the best. So uh, one more thing on my end, I'm just going to type in if I can figure out how to do it correctly here. I think I'm going to send you all a message with my contact information. If anybody would like to ask me any questions about anything, I'm happy to talk with any of you uh, or, you know, pass it on to your friends, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm open for uh, for comms. Okay, I'm going to see if I can do it here. Oh, and I had a question that was submitted. Uh, so this is directed to the retired chief and Captain Reyes. Uh, so um, it says... I have seen a couple of sailors secured in their rooms for mental health issues. How do you as a captain and chief know when making these decisions that this is the right thing to do? I'll let you go first. You want me to go first? <laughs> I've, never, I've never personally uh, encountered anybody um, a situation like that. The only time we ever had to lock anybody in their rooms is when we picked up a bunch of stowaways. But um, so I, I really, I really couldn't, don't have an experience with that. So anyway. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and step in. Um, I have seen uh, during the second Gulf War, we had a situation, um, not gonna go into a lot of details, but it turned into a dangerous situation um, where somebody that had been on board the vessel uh, in excess of 10 months and couldn't get home um, did lose it. And he had to uh, be restrained and uh, was put in irons and um, he did go home. So we did give him off the vessel uh, relatively quickly. Since that time, uh, we haven't, I haven't personally had to restrain somebody or lock somebody in their room. If that situation is starting to occur, um, I'm getting help from medical advice, uh, the company. Uh, we have asked people to wait in their rooms. Um, and on occasion, we have put uh, somebody outside the room to, to monitor that. Um, that normally doesn't last very long. If that, that situation is happening, uh, the crew member is most likely going to be sent home. And so the, the time that they're in their room awaiting that is the time that it's taking us to make those arrangements to contact the company, get all the backing, see if there's, you know, if there's anything, depending on the circumstance, if there's anything else that we can do. And if not, I will be looking at getting them a safe flight home and repatriating them. If I could, uh, if I could add to that, uh, on the ship, we had a, um, a member who had he and his wife had joined us without uh, and became pregnant when COVID shut us down. 
and eventually they wound up in Tenerife when they're from Senegal. And um, she came to delivery time. We don't deliver on the ship. So we got an exception to policy to get her on shore to get delivered and come back with the baby. And then after a few more months of this uh, it's being tied up, he got progressively more and more angry. And finally he threatened in several emails to the managing director on the ship that he would kill himself, his wife and his child. And if we wanted to keep them on the ship, then we could have their bodies at, the, at our door for the rest for eternity as kind of how it went down. Um, but he was insisting that we let him and his family off the ship all at the same time. And uh, that wasn't up to us. Spanish law did not permit that at the time. And so we had to sequester him from his family because he was a clear threat to them and to himself. And we had Gurkhas uh, from Nepal who serve as our um, uh, security on the ship. And they took turns monitoring him 24 seven. And eventually we slowly, as his behavior improved, we gave him more and more freedoms, but he never got, he was, it was another four to six weeks before we could get him off the ship because all the airports were closed. There's immigration issues with the new baby, had to have a passport, uh, you know, and the embassies were closed and it just went on and on. But uh, before he left, we were able to actually get the family together for periods during the day that were supervised. Um, but ramping up to that, it was a phone call a day, then two a day, then longer phone calls and you know, more and more freedoms as he proved that he could behave himself. Um, but yeah, it was a really long ordeal. But I guess to me, the bottom line is if you really need to do that to somebody, the need becomes obvious most of the time. If you're not sure it's necessary, it probably isn't. You just watch them close. You make some adjustments in terms of uh, not letting people be alone if you're worried about them and all that. But uh, holding them in the room, um, it's usually something pretty extreme and you'll, you'll know it when the time comes. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for those, for those uh, anecdotes. Um, so any other closing remarks from, from panelists then to, uh, to close up and then we'll, we'll kind of conclude? I would agree with, the, uh, with George and the captain that uh, no regrets, you know, no matter how many hardships you experience, uh, the experience itself was uh, one you'll talk about the rest of your life and you'll remember fond thing, fondly the things that happened that were good way better than I remember the hard things. And uh, so I, uh, I think by the fact that you're in the school and you're preparing for this shows it's already in your heart. And uh, I'm excited for you. I think you're gonna have a wonderful life. And, uh, and uh, this kind of thing that the school is doing for you now, these are the kinds of advice that help you to avoid some of the trauma and uh, maximize the joy. Thanks for the chance to speak with you. Well, George, you got anything? I just wanted to say thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. This has been, been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, thank you. And I'd like to say thank you as well. It's been an honor. And uh, I know Andre and I'll uh, return the thanks for, for agreeing with us, or agreeing to this, meeting with us, um, setting this up and, and being here for an hour. Um, we do want to say if anyone is interested in speaking further with our panelists about the maritime industry, their experiences, um, advice, or, or anything, uh, please reach out to myself and I can get you in touch with any one of them. Um, I know, you know, George met, put his phone in the chat. Um, Captain Reyes has also, you know, offered her, um, her assistance or whatever you want to talk about, um, especially women in the maritime industry. Um, you know, we know that it's a definitely a smaller subsection, Dr. Lamb as well. So uh, um, panelists, again, thank you. Cadets, as always, uh, CAPS hours, they are Monday through Friday, uh, 8.30 to 5. So if you do want to make a counseling appointment, please uh, reach out to them. They're all remote right now, but that is also part of this process as well. Um, and again, cadets, uh, community, faculty, everybody who joined us today, thank you uh, so much. And we'll look forward to uh, some more events like this in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you, George. Great to see you too, Chris. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> Take care. All right, you too.